Okay, for this lecture we're going to talk about a mnemonic. Uh, it's a popular mnemonic and it's used to describe or think about uh, lytic, bubbly bone tumors. And most of these are going to be benign looking things. Um, so the mnemonic uh, is phagnomashic. Uh, you may have heard this. Uh, you can rearrange this another way uh, into fog machine, same letters, different word, it doesn't matter. So if you like mnemonics, this is a good lecture for you to think about bone tumors. If you don't like mnemonics, probably best to stop right now before you damage your monitor with me babbling out about different mnemonics. All right, so uh, phagnomashic or fog machine, I just laid them out here following the phagnomashic, but again, it doesn't matter. Um, if you want to use mnemonics, you can think of it like this way. All these things are good things to think in a differential for benign uh, lytic uh, bone tumors. Now, this is not a complete list, and depending on the tumor, uh, for example, where it's located or the age of the patient or if there's one or multiple of them, you're going to refine this list. So this is not a list where you should just babble everything out on the list as soon as you say a lytic bone tumor. That's not the point of it. It's to give you things to think about uh, and then hopefully you can intelligently uh, whittle some of those things away and bring some to the forefront. So um, if you see a tumor, don't just uh, splay out the mnemonic because uh, that's not a good thing. We really want you to be able to uh, kind of intelligently winnow it down. All right, so what's on the list for uh, benign lytic bone tumors? This phagnomastic fog machine differential. Um, fibrous dysplasia is on the list. That's the F. Enchondromas, eosinophil granuloma, or Langerhans cell histiocytosis, but the L doesn't fit so well in the mnemonic, so you can add that in there and make up your own mnemonic if you like. Uh, giant cell tumor uh, is on the list. Non-ossifying fibromas. Osteoblastomas. Uh, metastasis and multiple myeloma is really the only malignant thing that's on this list. Uh, um, but if you remember, Mets and myeloma are by far the most common bone tumors you're going to see, especially in elderly adults. So uh, they're on the list and they can look benign sometimes. Aneurysm bone cyst, solitary bone cyst, brown tumors as seen in hyperparathyroidism. Um, again, the B doesn't really fit into the mnemonic, so we use the H for hyperparathyroidism. Uh, infection, and uh, lastly, uh, chondromyxoid fibroma or chondroblastoma. Uh, of those, chondroblastoma is going to be much more common than a chondromyxoid fibroma, which is a pretty rare tumor. And if you really never mention it uh, in your differential, you'll probably be right 99% uh, of the time because it's unlikely to crop up. Okay, so we're just going to go through this list. All right, so F, fibrous dysplasia. What is fibrous dysplasia? Fibrous dysplasia is, uh, think of it as a long tumor and a long bone. Uh, it's a classically described as having a ground glass matrix, which you can see here, this kind of ground glass component, which is really just kind of this smudged out fibrous uh, tissue in there. And on the radiograph, it looks you know, kind of smudgy like some uh, ground glass. Um, these are not uncommon. Fibrous dysplasia is pretty common. Usually when you see it, it's going to be a solitary lesion, uh, a long tumor and a long bone. So think of that one. You can see this one actually uh, extends all the way throughout the radius uh, here, obviously, there's a pathological fracture in it because the bone is being thinned out. Um, you can have polyostotic fibrous dysplasia. Uh, you will see those occasionally. Uh, there's two main syndromes you should probably know about for that. Uh, McCune-Albright, uh, which you're going to only see in girls, and they'll be associated with um, a precocious puberty and cafe au lait spots. And Mazabrow syndrome, which is associated with uh, soft tissue myxomas and polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, but usually just a single solitary lesion, uh, usually in the lung bones. Proximal femur is a common uh, and favorite location for it, and um, I don't have an example here, but if it's lung stain in the proximal femur, it'll give you the classic shepherd's crook deformity there. So fibrous dysplasia. All right, next up is enchondromas. Enchondromas are benign cartilaginous tumors. They're common. You're going to see enchondromas a lot. You'll see them in the hands. It's a common place for them. You'll see them in long bones. Um, often in the hands, they don't have any chondroid matrix. They may, but uh, it's not as common where the ones you see in the lung bones are almost always going to have uh, the typical kind of delicate chondroid matrix uh, you see. Um, there are two polyostotic conditions with enchondromas. We have multiple enchondromas. They are Oliers and Mifuchis. Uh Both of these are associated with multiple enchondromas. Mifuchis is associated with soft tissue hemangiomas as well. So if you see flebolis in the soft tissues and soft tissue masses and multiple uh, lytic lesions, uh, that's pretty much a tip off that this is multiple, these are multiple enchondromas and that is Mifuchi syndrome. 
things to worry about in enchondromas. How do you know your enchondroma has gone bad? Well, one, it's growing, so usually they shouldn't grow. Um, so it's growing or changing. Um, that's one way. Also, pain. Sometimes uh, we're not very good radiographically, so clinically you have to rely on the fact that this is now hurting. So pain is uh, an indication you need to think about that this uh, enchondroma has undergone malignant degeneration. Um, those are probably the two main things. Um, for solitary enchondromas to undergo malignant degeneration is very rare, but in the multiple enchondroma syndromes, it's uh, more common, and those are usually uh, we worry a little bit about more and monitor more closely. All right, next up, uh, eosinophilic granuloma. This is something you're going to think about only in children or young adults. Please don't think about eosinophilic granuloma in only adults. You're likely to be wrong. Um, so eosinophilic granuloma. Uh, this can be single, it can be multiple, it can look uh, very benign appearing, or it can look very aggressive, such as this one right here. This was a, a four-year-old with this lesion right here, and this is a, a, a more aggressive lesion. This is a geographic lytic lesion with a wide zone of transition, and there's this periosteal reaction associated with it, which kind of looks a little laminated, maybe it looks a little scary. Um, this one looks a little scary, but it just turned out to be a eosinophilic granuloma, uh, really just a benign bone tumor, uh, essentially. Um, classically, you'll see a bony sequestrum in, in the ones you see in the skull. There'll be a central sequestrum, so that's one thing uh, you can see in them as well. So, eosinophilic granuloma, Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Uh, really only consider this in children or younger adults. Uh, uh, not statistically likely to happen in uh, people over 30 or so. All right, next up, giant cell tumor. Giant cell tumors are, for the most part, benign tumors, though they can be very locally aggressive, they can recur, and they can actually metastasize, uh, usually to the lung. Now, these metastases are not going to kill you, but they'll, they'll still end up in your lung and grow. Um, that's a very rare percentage of them. So even though they're benign tumors, they can cause lots of problems with them, and they are very locally regressive, and they like to reoccur. So uh, giant cell tumors, giant cell tumors originate kind of at the epiphyseal, metaphyseal interface at the junction, and they grow to the articular surface. So you can see this one right here. We have a geographic lytic lesion, narrow zone of transition, non-sclerotic border, which is in the uh, epiphysis, the metaphysis is extending to the articular surface. Uh, this one doesn't have any periosteal reaction or fractures, but that's not uncommon to see in them uh, as well, too. Um, Key things about giant cell tumors, please don't say giant cell tumor in somebody whose growth plates are not yet closed. You're going to be wrong 99% of the time, or near majority percent of the time. Also, giant cell tumors don't have a sclerotic border, so that's another thing. So if you see something with a sclerotic border, border you can throw out giant cell tumor. Uh, also, giant cell tumors extend to the articular surface uh, and originate in the metaphyseal epiphyseal interface. So if it's not extending the articular surface, you can throw out giant cell tumor as one of your, your differentials. So um, so not in kids or people or, or whose growth plates haven't fused. Um, they have to extend to the articular surface, and they should not have a sclerotic border. But they can look very scary. They don't have to be uh, have a narrow zone of transition. They can actually have a wide zone of transition and be very aggressive looking. Um, but please remember those other things. The a knee... Here is a common place, the proximal tibia is a common place for giant cell tumors to occur. This was a, a giant cell tumor. This is one that's had uh, recurred. This patient has had uh, multiple resections and packing for the giant cell tumor in their distal tibia. It's not windowed very well, but this is all packing material in the distal tibia from the resection. There's a rod in their bone. Uh, and you can see here, here's the tumor recurrence, uh, kind of expanding outwards from what's left of the distal tibia there. So. Uh, like I said, their local recurrence uh, is a common problem with these uh, tumors. All right, next up, non-ossifying fibromas or fibroxanthomas. These are going to be benign lesions. Uh, they're going to be common in kids. Um, somebody's going to come in, they twist their ankle, you're going to see one of these things. Pediatricians are all going to get worked up, and they're going to order a CT and MRI, and hopefully your job is to please stop them from getting the million-dollar workup. You can look at this on the radiograph and say, hey, this is just a non-ossifying fibroma. Uh, it's a benign lesion. It's not causing many problems. It'll just go away. Please leave it alone. So uh, where do they occur? Typical uh, appearance and location. They're going to be eccentrically located lesions, usually in the kind of distal metadiaphysis or proximal metadiaphysis 
uh, and they're going to have a narrow zone of transition and a sclerotic border, just like this one here. This is eccentrically located or maybe slightly cortically based. Typical appearance and location for these. Note that this is a child. And gradually over time, these will start to fill in and ossify. Um, then some people call them ossifying, non-ossifying fibromas, which gets confusing. So uh, other people use the term fibrosanthoma, which kind of eliminates the problem of having to say, well, your non-ossifying fibroma is now ossifying. And that just confuses people. But a fibrosanthoma, non-ossifying fibroma, will gradually fill in with time. Um, what you'll see as they fill in is you'll just see this remnant, the kind of the sclerotic remnant. So this was once a non-ossifying fibroma that's now um, filled in and it's just gone away. You'll see this occasionally. Obviously, this patient has a fracture here from something else. But um, There are two syndromes where you'll see uh, multiple non-ossifying fibromas. Uh, one of them is Jaffe Campanacci, uh, and the other is neurofibromatosis 1. You can uh, sometimes see multiple non-ossifying fibromas. Both of those, by the way, are associated with uh, cafe au lait spots. Next up is the osteoblastoma. Um, this is a pretty rare tumor. Uh, you're unlikely to see them. If you do see them, you're probably going to see them in the spine is where they like to, like to occur. Um, they're generally lytic, but they can have internal matrix. And this is a tumor uh, in young patients. This is a rare example of a periosteal osteoblastoma, which is really not typical. Much more typical is one you're going to see uh, occurring in the spine, like this one here. as expands how lytic lesion. You can see there's this matrix inside here. Um, and this was an osteoblastoma. Spine is a, a more common location for you to see them. Metastasis. So Met's very common. Please think of metastasis, especially in an adult. Um, 40, 50, older, Met's are going to be more likely bone tumors, or if they have a known history of malignancy, obviously. Um, they can look benign. Um, metastasis tend to be expansionalytic, are renal and thyroid metastasis. But they're not the only ones, but they're common ones that tend to do it. So here you can see one, this was a, a geographic lytic lesion which has a pathological fracture through it, and this was a metastatic uh, tumor, and th this was actually a breast metastasis, but um, renal and thyroid are the two kind of prototypes you should think of for expansile lytic metastasis. Multiple myeloma, plasmacytoma, again, very common in older adults, over 50 you're going to think of METS, or sorry, you're going to think of multiple myeloma or plasma cytoma. Please don't talk about this in younger adults or kids. Not going to happen. But these are super common. So a solitary plasma cytoma, like they're in the scapula right here, uh, can occur. This expands analytic lesion. This was a plasma cytoma. Actually, if you look closely, there's another lesion in the rib right here. That was another focus of multiple myeloma. Um, so this is the more geographic appearance of multiple myeloma, the plasma cytoma. And then this is the more permeated or mothing appearance. We can see this, these lesions kind of permeating throughout the femur and the pelvis, uh, diffuse multiple myeloma in this case. Uh, again, super common. Please think of it in older adults. Next on the list are aneurysmal bone cysts. These are one that, they're not really tumors. They're just kind of blood-filled cavities that develop in the bone. Um, and they, but they will kind of grow and expand as they continue filling with blood. Uh, at some level, you essentially create like an AV uh, malformation or fistula there. Um, you're going to see these usually in children or younger adults, and they're going to be very expansile, aneurysmal, as the name implies. So um, don't think of it if it's not really aneurysmal. They tend to be very aneurysmal. You can see one right here, very geographic lytic lesion, which is quite expansile and aneurysmal. It's thinned out the cortex, so it's almost imperceptible and can look kind of scary because the cortex is all gone and you wonder um, if it's a more aggressive lesion. Uh, this one is a narrow zone of transition, though, still, uh, and centered in the uh, metadiaphysis of the fourth metatarsal here. Um, this was just an aneurysmal bone cyst. Sometimes they can have septations within them as well, too. You'll see those on the radiograph. When you go to MRI, uh, classically, this fluid-fluid level is what you would see from the blood products layering in there. This is the same tumor we just saw, but their MRI, you can see a nice example of fluid fluid layers from the blood layering out. There is a differential diagnosis for a fluid fluid level on MR, which we'll just talk about really briefly. Um, generally, I don't think you should be diagnosing bone tumors in MR without looking at the radiograph. If you don't have the radiograph, you're going to get yourself in trouble. But if you just have fluid fluid levels, common things to think about are going to be an aneurysmal bone cyst, a giant cell tumor, also have fluid fluid levels. Uh, chondroblastomas and telangiectatic osteosarcomas can also have fluid fluid levels on MR. 
But again, please uh, compare it to the radiograph to help you say something smart about it. You're going to get in trouble if you start diagnosing bone tumors based on an MR alone. All right, next up, the solitary or unicameral bone cyst. Uh, different terms, same thing. This is really just a simple cyst filled with fluid. They tend to originate around the metaphysis um, um, and have, over time can migrate into the diaphysis. So you'll see them in the meta metaphysis and diaphysis. You're going to see these in children and young adults. Uh, again, proximal humerus is a common location, favorite location. So this is a child. There's this geographic lytic lesion, narrow zone of transition centered in the metaphysis of the proximal humerus. There's a pathological fracture through this one in a fallen fragment sign here. A piece of bone floating in the fluid-filled cyst. Uh, that fallen fragment sign is classic for a unicameral bone cyst. So you see that uh, and something that looks like this in this location in a child. Really, you're done. Unicameral bone cyst. This one will get treated because it, it's fractured. Next on the list are hyperparathyroidism, is the H in the mnemonic, um, and we really use this to think of brown tumors. Uh, brown tumors are just kind of focal collections of osteoclasts which chew up the bone and it's replaced by this uh, fibrous and vascular tissue. Uh, you can have multiple uh, brown tumors or you can have a solitary one. And the real key to making this diagnosis is to looking for other other clues in the uh, in the skeletal system of hyperparathyroidism. Uh, so in this radiograph of the hand, for example, we see there's this geographic lytic lesion in the distal radius. There's uh, a couple in the carpal bones. Uh, and then we look for other signs of hyperparathyroidism. So we see this band-like uh, resorption of the distal uh, phalanges right here, this kind of acroosteolysis in a way, this typical band-like resorption. We also see subperiosteal resorption along the radial aspect of the second and third distal phalanges. Note the bones also is very uh, osteopenic, bone mineralization abnormal. Uh, and on the corner shot of the film, you see these vascular calcifications here as well, too. So all, I'm sorry, not vascular, soft tissue calcifications. Uh, all manifestations of hyperparathyroidism, you put all these together, there's really only one of these things, one thing that uh, these lesions can be, and that is uh, brown tumors. But they can be confusing at times. Uh, infection is on the list. Uh, focal infection, Brody's abscess. Um, always think of infection and when you see something that looks like a bone tumor because infection can mimic a lot of different things. They can be fungal infections, TB, bacteria. Um, I, I don't think you'd be able to differentiate them uh, from just looking at the radiograph uh, often. Um, sometimes TB is more typical manifestations. But just a nice example here, geographic lytic lesion, the central bony sequestrum, which is typical of a Brody's abscess. Uh, this is the distal radius on a CT scan. Um, so Brody's abscess or infection is on your list of differentials. Getting to the end now, the C, uh, chondroblastoma. Chondroblastomas are going to be uh, benign appearing lytic lesions. They're going to occur in the epiphysis. Um, so here we have right on uh, the proximal humerus, a geographic lytic lesion, narrow zone of transition in the epiphysis of the proximal humerus. Typical location uh, should always be on your differential diagnosis for epiphyseal lesions in a child or a young adult. Uh, these really don't occur in elderly adults, um, though there is a mimic in uh, older adults, which is a clear cell chondrosarcoma, can sometimes look like this. Uh, you take these to MRI, they're going to have a lot of reactive edema around them, and that's one of their, their features on an MRI. But um, again, uh, epiphyseal lesion, young adult, uh, think of chondroblastoma. Uh, last lesion is a chondromyxoid fibroma. These are pretty rare lesions. Uh, they're benign cartilaginous lesions. You're not going to see many of these, um, so we won't talk about them too much. They tend to be eccentrically located and are common in the tibia. This is an example of a chondromyxoid fibroma, benign lesion there.